Good. Hello and welcome to everyone, and in particular uh, our guest today, Jose Manuel Campa. Um, Jose Manuel is chair of the European Banking Authority, one of the three supervisory agencies established during the Euro crisis more than a decade ago. Uh, he is eminently qualified to both speak to us today on the topic uh, that he's speaking on, as you know, and to lead the EBA. He's a Harvard-educated academic economist, something he spent most of his life uh, doing, teaching, researching. Uh, he's also been a banker, and he was Spain's deputy economy and finance minister during one of the most challenging times in, in recent times, uh, the Great Recession and the start of the Euro crisis between 2009 and 2011. He's going to speak to us uh, for 20, 25 minutes, uh, and after that, he'll take questions and comments, and everything is on the record. Jose Manuel, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a real, for me, a pleasure and honor to be with you today, and I look forward to our exchange of views. Um, I will make some reflections on, you know, uh, how I see the banking sector today, the situation that's confronted within the broader context of the challenges to the European economy, and then I look forward to the to the exchange. Uh, as it was said, I'm the chairperson of the European Banking Authority. The European Banking Authority is a, an authority and a European institution, part of the European Union institutions that was created uh, partially as a response to the great financial crisis that was mentioned in the introduction in 2011. It was uh, one of three authorities that were created at the time by the European Union, actually three or four authorities, three authorities and one institution, which is the, the Banking Authority, the ESMA, the European Securities Market Authority, with responsibility on securities markets, EOPA, with responsibility on the insurance sector, and the European Systemic Risk Board with macro prudential responsibility, or with assessment of macro risks. Uh, these authorities have been functioning for the last 11 years now. In the area of banking, we all have essentially the same responsibilities, which is to work towards the creation of a single rule book by developing secondary legislation in the European Union within our areas of competence, and at the same time to foster supervisory convergence and ensure financial stability. Now, how that has evolved over the last decade in the different sectors is a little bit different. I will talk particularly about the European Banking Authority with the banking sector. Of course, we have since 2014 a banking union and supranational supervision for large systemic institutions at the, within the banking union at the SSM. So, the, so our mandate on banking supervision has progressed a lot because there is a lot of effort that has been done by the SSM to ensure homogeneous supervision across the union. Still, a fair amount of work that needs to be done to foster that coordination between Euro and non-Euro and non -Euro area member states, and that's a big challenge. But overall, uh, it's been good. In the area of regulatory regulation, as well as secondary regulation, the banking sector also, again, it's more integrated in the sense that it's more under, regula under regulation rather than directives at the European Union level, so it's more of a single rule book that has progressed farther than the other areas, that's in which we have progressed farther. Third, on financial stability, as you're probably aware, the European Bank Authority does a stress test of the banks every two years to assess the assessment. This has been very much at the forefront from the beginning of the, of the creation of, of, the, of the authority back in 2011, where precisely the banking sector was at the core of concerns about the stability of the European Union financial sector. Beyond that, we have uh, integrated responsibilities in other areas, particularly in the case of the ABA, we have responsibilities for payments and developing the relationship on payments and e-money type of activities uh, under the PSD2. Also for anti-money laundering, we are responsible for anti-money, for coordinating anti-money laundering. This is an area in which, as you probably know, the European Union has put forward a package to enhance, again, more regulation at the European level and more supranational supervision with the proposal to create a new authority, a new AML authority that will be responsible for the supervision of the large institutions. And we're very keen for that to take place. At that time, we will transfer those responsibilities to that. More recently, we also have responsibility with the other ESAs on three important aspects, on sustainability, climate-related regulation in the financial sector, 
on operational resilience of the financial sector, digital under what's called the Digital Operational Resilience Act, and finally on the regulation of crypto assets, the markets for crypto assets. So this was a, a relatively long with the introduction, but at least to keep put you in context of who we are and where we operate. Now, if I may go to the context of my remarks, which are more focused on the situation of the banking sector within the broader context of the economic situation. So it's fair to say that we are confronted, and we are just discussing this early on before we started, but we're confronting a moment of a relatively large economic uncertainty. It's only a moment of significant change in the economic environment in which we go from a decade of very low interest rates, almost close in Europe, sometimes negative interest rates, uh, into an area of positive interest rates. We're going that, we're going through that transition, not just in Europe, but across all the Western world, with interest rates going up, at the same time that we're confronted with two significant real economic shocks over the last two, three years. One was COVID and the aftermath of COVID. The second one was the geopolitical tensions that arose last, last, last year, particularly the, the invasion or the, or the aggression of Russia towards the Ukraine that had significant implications in terms of reassignment of relative prices, reassignment of, of negative shocks to the economy going forward. Within that context, if I may, uh, the performance of the banking sector in Europe has been very resilient, a large resilience. In some ways, uh, I will even go further, it'll be a bit surprising that has been so resilient, partially thanks to the uh, exceptional monetary and fiscal policies that were put in place to confront those challenges, which were very uh, assertive at the European level, but you could not always count on them, particularly not ex ante. So we're now in a situation in which we have a, a banking sector that has a very good performance in terms of asset uh, or in terms of balance sheet parameters. The level of capital of uh, banks is about 15% according to the last number, a little bit above 15% according to the last numbers, correct with the tier one, which is uh, it's, it's not an all-time high, but very close to the all-time high, significantly much, much larger than it has been a decade ago. Uh, the liquidity situation of the banks is also very comfortable uh, with 163% on what we call the liquidity coverage ratio, which is the regulatory ratio that we use to assess short-term liquidity of banks. The regulatory uh, requirement is 100% and it's 160%, again, close to all-time highs. The profitability of the sector, which has been a challenge over the last decade, in which profitability has been low, particularly below the cost of equity, according to the estimates by financial markets, has improved over the last two years with, with interest rates, sorry, with return on equity uh, uh, for 2022 of slightly above 8%, which is the highest in a decade. So it has been good. And the asset quality of the banks has been good. The ratio of non-performing loans has been declining substantially, uh, and, and substantially, but more importantly, constantly throughout the last five years. All through the COVID crisis, we saw the, the improvements in the ratio of non-performing loans, which was surprising to us. And partially, this is due to two aspects I mentioned before. One was the exceptional monetary and fiscal policies that were put in place to support the economy at the European level. The other one was that some of the legacy non-performing loan portfolios from the great recession and financial crisis that were still in the balances of, of banks in some parts of the union continue to decline significantly, particularly when I think about some of the countries that have been subject to programs, Greece, in Greece, in, in Cyprus as well, you know, those ratios continue to decline. So those are all good signs and they're encouraging. Our forecast or our, or our concern has been of the last three years that we need to be prudent because we will expect first with COVID and then with the, with the tensions that happened out of the uh, geopolitical tensions last year, we we'll expect that there will be a deterioration of the economy and that deterioration of the economy will manifest itself in decreases in credit quality of the banks. As I said before, that has not materialized yet. We think that some of it may materialize as we go forward as the economy deteriorates. On top of that, and you may have been aware of this, um, over the last three months, there's been moments of tensions in the banking sector across the world, particularly in the United States and, and in Switzerland. There have been cases of resolutions of banks and bankruptcy of banks uh, 
for different reasons, uh, which I'll try to summarize. In the United States, there was particularly concerns about potential um, deposit runs and liquidity management concerns as interest rates rise. As interest rates rise, uh, this has different impacts on the banking on the banking business, depending on the business model of the banks. One immediate impact is that obviously on the loans, if they have particularly they have variable rate loans, they can increase the net interest income because that's good for them. On the liability side, on the other hand, depending on their ability to price or, or, or their requirement to reprice their liabilities, they may have less of a demand. And that's actually what we have seen in many European countries as we go along this first cycle of the economic the, of the of the interest rate increase, in which we see that the asset sites, particularly where there were variable rate loans, have been repriced. However, deposits prices continue to be relatively sticky. At the same time, if they have fixed income assets like debt and things like that, the value of those assets may drop as interest rate rise. And that puts tension on the, tension on the bank's balance sheet overall. Uh, that led to some concerns, as I say, in particularly Silicon Valley Bank in the United States that was resolved. But then additionally, uh, other concerns about the asset quality of the banks, particularly in, in commercial real estate, also increase uh, the uh, uncertainty about the future banking sector, raising uh, the, or resulting in the intervention of other banks in the days, like First Republic Bank. And we have not seen that in the European Union so far. We have not seen that uh, mainly because of two aspects, uh, I would think. One is because there was no such a, a extreme business model in terms of concentration of, of uninsured deposits on the liability side, concentration of help to maturity portfolios of debt in the asset side of the banks, in any bank in Europe that would, that would materialize the same way that it did in the United States. That's one aspect. Uh, second, also because the, the trends that are affecting the real estate market in the United States in a much more a clear way that's probably affecting the European. Although the underlying structural changes and challenges may be similar, just the way at the speed in which it's materializing is taking longer in Europe. But that's a potential area of concern from our side as we go forward. Having said that, let me just, uh, I'm conscious of the, of the time that I've been allocated. I want to try to, to, to use it effectively. Having said that about the, the, the environment and, and in terms of the economic conditions, it's fair to say that there are a number of other risks and challenges affecting the sector overall that I think we need to, to be aware of and conscious and try to address them, you know? And I'll try to focus on four, you know? The first one is in terms of operational resilience of the sector. You know, we are moving into a sector that uh, has been uh, obviously digitalized over time. Now, that operational resilience has many dimensions to it, but it's an area of concern. I'll try to mention briefly three on those directions, three potential risks and vulnerabilities that we see there. First one is cybersecurity. In a moment, and this is very high on our list of risks, in a moment in which the geopolitical tensions, and particularly over the last 12 months, we were very concerned about potential cybersecurity risks on the, on, on the operational side of the banks. This fortunately has not yet materialized, but this is an area in which we should continue to remain vigilant, and it's very important. Second one related to that, which is not about cyber security itself, is digital operational resilience. The sector has become much more digitalized, and it has subcontracted a lot. And a lot of that subcontracting has moved away from the financial sector into other operators. Just to be very simplistic, basically, the banks are moving things to the cloud, and the cloud providers are not financial, are not financial entities, they're not either regulated entities. In addition to that, they're very concentrated. So concentration risks on that operational resilience is very large because a few operators are basically providing services to a large amount of the European Union financial sector. So that's the second risk. Third one that I may link to this is through digitalization. This has already materialized very closely in the crisis I mentioned in the United States. There's a much, much bigger ability to move money faster across the world. That, that may lead to deposit runs and provide financial instability, but they also lead to more abilities to financial crime. Therefore, they need to enhance our AML practices and it may lead potentially to vulnerabilities in the banking sector, either because of, of, of compliance concerns on, on, on money laundering or because just liquidity concerns on a potential deposit or energy crisis. So that's one big area, all the operational resilience aspects. Now, very much to the operational resilience, a second big challenge to the sector is, more broadly, technology and competition and drivers of technology that's coming into the industry. 
This is transforming many sectors in the economy. Uh, the financial sector and the banking sector in particular, it's an intermediation sector. When we think about intermediation sectors in the economy, they've been heavily transformed. When I think about real estate agencies, when I think about travel agencies, when I think about music, music distributors, any kind of distribution in the economy has been heavily affected by technology. Well, the financial sector is a distribution. An industry which does distribution, that may be affected. From the payment sector to the transfer to potentially other parts of the financial sector, and that's a challenge that needs to be assessed carefully and regulated going forward. Third aspect, which is not particularly for the banking sector, but it's more general to the European economy, but of course affects the financial sector, banking sector, is sustainability. Sustainability, you all know the, the priority that the European Union puts on the transition to a sustainable economy, the implications that that has in terms of the challenge that it has in all dimensions of how to transform our economy. The financial sector has a role to play there, at least, if not more than one, but at least one, which is to make sure that there's adequate financing to finance the transition and to, to transfer the, the productive capacity of the productive activities that the European Union performs. Banks need to make progress in that direction and we're pushing them heavily to advance on that direction. And then the fourth one, if I may, is regulation. We're operating, and I, said, I started this by saying the European Bank Authority has responsibilities for developing a single market in the European Union. We're operating in a single market that it's incomplete to say the least. We're operating a banking union that's incomplete, and we're operating in a situation with the benefits of that single market, the cross-border provision of services, the capability of, of generating risk diversification across, across the private sector by channeling money from one, from one part of the union to another part of the union, from wherever the, the savings are to wherever the investments are, it's difficult, and in which we need to progress. And we have been, um, we have been, I would say, slow, yeah, but slow implies movement. We have been slow in finalizing the banking union and in progressing in that area. And that's an area in which we need uh, uh, to continue to push forward and with the momentum is not there in the short term, but we need to, to, to be built as we go forward. Jointly with that, and not so much having to do with the European uh, banking sector in particular, but more broadly with the financial sector, we also have to think about the structure of our financial sector in the context of a post-Brexit European Union. In the context of a post-Brexit European Union, I like to say you know, the, United, the United Kingdom was a member of the Union, was one country in the Union, was more than one country when you think about in terms of the GDP and the relevance in certain parts of the economy, it was certainly more than one country when we think about the financial services of the European Union, and that's a challenge that we need to address going forward uh, what's really pending. Again, this, is, this has a little bit to do with banks because at the end, the key channel that remains for financial intermediation in the European Union right now is the banking sector because the capital market is uh, undeveloped, underdeveloped. But in that sense, it has to do with banks, but it's not only with banks. And we know there that all the agenda on finalizing the capital markets union in the European Union, final, I shouldn't say finalizing, starting. I would say maybe or pursuing the capital markets union is it's a very important aspect of that agenda. So within that context, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stop here. As I said, the banks sector in particular have been resilient in the European Union. They show to they seem to have now a, a good starting position in terms of balance sheet, in terms of liquidity, in terms of performance as well. Uh, low asset quality, in an, in, and they're operating okay in a macroeconomic environment. There is uncertainty in which risks may materialize and are likely to materialize as, as, as I would like to think going forward. Within our third mandate that I mentioned before of financial stability, we're now in the middle of performing the stress test that we do every two years for the, for the banking sector in the union. We will publish the results uh, at the end of next month in July. We hope that those results will help. As you know, with those results, we publish a large amount of, of bank-specific information. We hope that those results will help in enhanced transparency, in enhanced confidence, and will also help uh, supervisors engage with, the, with each individual bank on how they, their assessment is of their situation going forward and what their weaknesses are so they can address them. And that's part of our confidence-building process. But uh, it's a context in which uh, 
given the uncertainties around the macroeconomic environment, given the incomplete banking union, and given the challenge that I mentioned before on operational resilience, sustainability, and technology, <coughs> uh, it's something that we need to remain quite vigilant as we go forward.